You're listening to The Portfolio Composer, hosted by me, Dr. Garrett Hope, where business and creativity go hand in hand. Join us at theportfoliocomposer.com for news, talks, and workshops. This episode is brought to you by Dorico, the music notation software from Steinberg. Dorico Pro 3 is a major new version with game-changing advances in note input, notation, and engraving. Also available from Steinberg is Dorico Elements, an entry-level application that packs all of the essential power of Dorico Pro into a simple, streamlined package that is ideal for those getting started. Find out more later in the show. Welcome to episode 238 of the Portfolio Composer podcast. Who knew I would ever get to 238 episodes? Holy smokes. That's awesome. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Thank you for being with me as we go on this journey of exploring what it means to be a composer in the 21st century. I firmly believe that we can make it happen. We can create our own realities and we can create the careers we want to create. Today's episode features a composer who has done that. He's created the career that he wants to have, and his name is Jeremy Turner. Composer, conductor, and multi-instrumentalist Jeremy Turner is known for creating innovative and diverse music for the moving image and the stage. He is a two-time Emmy nominee, has won the Music and Sound Award, the International Documentary Association Award, the AICP Award, and has been named in NPR Music's Favorite Song of the Year. Jeremy recently completed scores for Marvel's 616 for Disney+, HBO's What Remains Behind, and the Netflix documentary series Immigration Nation. Enjoy. Hey, Jeremy. Welcome to the Portfolio Composer. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to speak with you because your journey is an unusual one for the kind of work you're doing, which I think is fascinating. And one of the things I want to dig into is to demonstrate to the people who are listening that there's not one path. And that it's really a choose-your-own-adventure kind of story that we live. Definitely. But as you know, the name of the podcast comes from the idea of having a diversified portfolio of income-producing activities. So I want to start with this question. Jeremy, what's in your portfolio? What are you doing to pay the bills? Let's see. It's quite diverse. It's obviously shifted a bit during you know the pandemic, as it has for everyone, but It's typically a mixture of film and television work, some commercial work, sometimes some concert music, sometimes some fashion projects, even runway shows. (laughs) So um, it used to have a little bit more performance in there, but that has dropped off considerably to a point where I I almost don't perform at all anymore, except for my three-year-old daughter. So yeah, I had those same freelancer nightmares that everybody has, like, you finish a big project that's, you know, takes up your whole life and then it's over and you're like, oh my God, what's happening next? Where, where's the next, you know, project coming from? And yeah. it's sort of a balance of constantly having a lot of lines in the, to use the fishing metaphor, a lot, a lot of lines in the water and you never know, you know, which one's going to bite. So. Sure. No, that's a good metaphor. What kind of things are you doing to cast those lines? How do you keep attracting new fish, so to speak? You know, it's great to have an agent. It's great to have some PR people when you've got something to promote, but it's all relationship-based as most businesses are. So it's staying in touch with people. It's if you've got something that you want to share with people, sometimes it's just checking in, you know, out of sight, out of mind, which is even easier to do these days because, you know, there's no dinners, there's no meetings. So it can be as simple as sending an email to a producer or a director and checking in and saying, you know, hey, look at this thing I just did. How are you? What are you working on? You know, and just trying to stay in front of people's vision point so that you're not forgotten about and tossed aside because there's a lot of composers out there. So you're trying to stay top of mind. Yeah. And it's hard because it's a balancing act. You know, for instance, right now I'm writing a film score that has 80 minutes of music. So that takes up all my time. So I've had a to-do list of people that I want to check in with and that's just been sitting there for a couple of weeks. So to use another analogy, if you've got two cars in the garage and one car is your, you know, actionable composing and writing music and doing the actual work and your other car is call it your sales and marketing car or whatever you want to call it. Sure. It's pretty hard to have both out at the same time. So I wish I was more dedicated about it. But, you know, some people I know take uh, an hour each day and say, okay, this hour, I'm just going to catch up on my emails and reach out to people. And it could be as simple as scouring IMDb and seeing what's coming up. Or 
in advertising, you know, following a couple trade papers and seeing who's working on which projects. And do you know anybody there that might be able to give you an opportunity? And I know there's a lot of composers in Hollywood that don't like to talk about commercials or advertising. And, you know, for some reason, that's a taboo thing. But, you know, if I were to live off of uh, indie film scores, <laughs> it, it would be uh, Campbell Soup every night for dinner. So <laughs> <laughs> you, you, I, as you said, you know, you got to have a diversified portfolio. And that includes saying yes to things and keeping your mind open to various different possibilities. And fortunately, I've gotten to a place now where I can turn down things that I don't want to do. You know, if somebody calls me for a low budget thing or somebody calls me for a project that I don't particularly believe in or don't want to be a part of, you know, it could be a pharmaceutical commercial or anything, you know, <laughs> but I'm, I'm always more than happy to pass that on too. you know, like I, sure. I've got a lot of composer friends and say, Hey, you know, this isn't my thing, but this guy would do great. Or this girl's fantastic. Give her a call, you know? So it's just building up a big enough snowball that God, I'm just all metaphors this morning, but <laughs> that, that, that you're, uh, you know, you're constantly rolling and, and picking up stuff along the way. Well, and once that snowball gets in motion, all you have to do is keep it in motion. The hardest part is getting it started. Yes. Getting it started is definitely the hardest part for sure. I want to circle back because you keep bringing up this idea of reaching out. Mm -hmm. You've said those words several times. And this is something that I get asked a lot by people who are trying to build their careers. How do I reach out to someone? How do I provide value and demonstrate that I'm interested in what they're interested in and not just asking and being needy? Like no one wants to get emails from that composer every week saying, hire me for your project. Yeah, I think there's a fine line between, you know, like I never do mailing lists. I never do, you know, if I were to send out a blast, so to speak, like a, you know, a BCC kind of deal, I would only do that, you know, maybe twice a year or something like that. Yeah, nobody want. most people will just either not read it or delete it. Or, you know, I, I don't think those things really ever work that well for what we do. But most successful engagements I've found are always going to be more, you know, person to person. So, so you're reaching out to warm contacts. That means people you've met in person or already engaged with in some way, not cold emails. Yeah. I don't really do that anymore. Although I had to do that when I was first getting started for sure. Like, you know, Hey, my name is Jeremy. I have nothing to show you, but you know, let me tell you about why you should call me and I'll make you look good. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, that's a tough game when you're, you know, doing smoke and mirrors. It's, it definitely gets easier, you know, as the snowball gets bigger, as you said, but you also have to, you have to be humble about it. I mean, sure. If you're, you know, in the top 1%, you know, John Williams or Hans Zimmer or something like that, I mean, look, even those guys are going out to dinner every now and then, but it doesn't help you to sit back and be like, I'm a genius, you know, let them come to me. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a lot of super, super talented people out there who are barely getting by, you know, so you, you have to be proactive and you have to be connecting with folks. And that's just the name of the game. Totally is. That's the art of networking, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. And I get it. It feels weird, you know. Look, as you mentioned, I, I was a performer before this. You know, I had a weekly paycheck and everything was fine and I didn't have to hustle per se. It's definitely a big slice of humble pie when you're starting to get into that, but you have to do it, you know? Like I said, it doesn't do you any good to just sit around waiting for the phone to ring, so. No. I really would like to dig into what your emails look like when you're reaching out. Would you mind sharing that? So when you reach out to someone, maybe you've already worked with them on a project or you've met them at a dinner or something, what does that email look like? Is it just a, hey, I'm checking in, seeing how you're doing, or are you updating them on your projects? Or are you asking questions? Yeah, it just depends, you know? I just emailed a producer friend of mine in New York last week with a little link to the, the Marvel thing that came out and just said, you know, hey, Looks like I'm joining the Marvel Universe, to, you know, like, uh, you know, a little wink and a nod and just how are you doing, you know, whatever. That could be kind of the soft, the show and tell approach, as I would call it. But mm -hmm. the other thing is, you know, hey, maybe there's some director that you worked with and you had a great experience with and everything went really well and you haven't 
been in touch for a couple months and you read something in deadline that they have something that went into production, you, you know, it could just be a simple congratulations. How are you? You know, as opposed to like, Hey, look at me. What, what did I do? So yeah, I'm probably a little bit more proactive about it in the advertising world than I am in, you know, film and TV land, just because the turnover is so quick, you know, mm-hmm. projects come and go and there's tons of them. And, and I have a producer and friend who helps me out with that stuff. And we use a, a software program called Daylight, which is, it's kind of contact management, but it also has calendar and you can put all of your, you know, paperwork in there and all that kind of stuff and set reminders so that, you know, maybe it's a, uh, Hey, we haven't, we haven't heard from this person in a while. Let's let's set a reminder to check in, that kind of thing. Cool. I'll check that out. Okay, so maybe you haven't thought about it in this way, but you just listed out two different approaches. You said mm-hmm. there's the show and tell approach and then the mm-hmm. congratulations approach. I right. think those are two wonderful strategies for keeping that contact warm. Are there any other approaches that you think composers could implement into their business right now? There are. I think the tricky thing, if it's not one of those two and it's in, and it's in between, it's hard because then you really got to have something to talk about. Yeah, otherwise, it can get annoying. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you don't want to be that guy. Yeah, like you don't you don't want to be a nuisance. I mean, obviously, depending on your relationship with the person, if it's someone you know really well, I mean, I've been fortunate enough to build up enough of a like for me and, and for a lot of composers, there's not much of a separation between, you know, whatever people call life and then work. Like it's kind of all the same thing. So yeah. I try to make a point of working with people that I really like to work with so that, you know, I was very fortunate to work on a play in New York years ago. It was the final play directed by Mike Nichols. And obviously, you know, if you're Mike Nichols, you've got carte blanche, you can do whatever you want. But he used to have this thing, no assholes. And that applied to the lighting department, the costume department, the everybody. He just wanted to make sure that everybody was ready to work and was a good person. And so it makes it easier if your uh, work life and your client list or however you want to describe it is, is made up of people that you enjoy working with. And it makes things easier. It, it's a lot easier to check in with somebody that you actually care about, you know, um, and, and those lines for me have, have become very blurred. You know, a lot of the people that I work with, I consider good friends. And um, some of them were at my wedding and I met them from projects or whatever. Um, so, but yeah, that's, that's a long roundabout way of saying, you know, the, the in-between, if it's not the show and tell or the congratulations, I think it's, it, it really depends on the relationship you have with the person. Makes sense. But the number one goal would be to not be annoying. You know, no, nobody <laughs> wants to, you have to have a good reason for reaching out, you know? And the people who end up being unlikable, right? In your director's parlance, if they become assholes, they don't get hired again. That's the hope. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, or it could be just someone, you know, I had a unpleasant experience on a project in the advertising world a couple of years ago where somebody made me do round after round after round of, you know, no, we don't like it. No, it's not right. Do it again. Do it again. Give us more options. This and this. All the while, they secretly, even though we had been awarded the job, they secretly had someone else that they wanted to use the whole time and ended up using that person in the end. And it just was a big waste of my time. It was a big waste of their time. And it just told me something about that person that made it really easy for me. I'm like, okay, well, I don't ever want to work with you again because you're not straightforward, right. you know? And, and you're going to bump into that stuff. You know, there's no shortage of problematic uh, experiences and, and difficult people, but it, you have to figure out if it's worth it for you to, you know, stick with that stuff. Oh man, this is a perfect example of something that's written about in business books all the time. And I know that you read those books. It's the like, know, and trust idea. right. We do business with people that we like and that we know and that we trust. And so right. if you violate any of those three, why would you continue having a business relationship or any relationship with that person? Right. Right. It's just life's too short, you know? And that being said, there are, you know, those stories of, oh man, this director, like he's a genius, but he, he he's so difficult and he made me write the score, you know, five different ways and 
dragged on and on and on. And, and then at the finish line, you're like, you know what? It was worth it. I'll do that again because the project's so great or he's so great or she's so amazing or whatever it is. But, um, you know, if it's a commercial and it's like a 30 second thing, like, no, thanks. There's enough fish in the sea. You know, I'll just fish elsewhere, you right. know? So wow, this is really good stuff, Jeremy. Thank you. Oh, more, more than happy to show you what goes on under the hood. I mean, I'm, I'm not shy about it. You know, I, I really am not. I, I know there's, there's probably more mystique to, you know, being a Banksy or something and just nobody knows that I do commercials on the side or, you know, but it's, you got to make a living, you know, I left a, a well-paying orchestral job and, you know, I wanted to make sure that if I was doing that, part of it was for happiness and the ability to create and, mm. you know, hack my own path forward. But I also wanted to make sure I was certainly going to be making as much, if not more, Sure. you know, otherwise, you know, it's not, not really worth it. Well, and you, as you build your catalog, the back end grows too. Yeah, exactly. This episode is sponsored by Dorico, the future of scoring. And we want to feature real Dorico users so you can know that real composers out in the world today are using Dorico to make their careers happen. My name is Homayoun Kazemi. I'm a composer. I'm studying my master's degree in the Utrecht Conservatory in Holland. I study spectralism and I combine Iranian music melodies and a lot of stuff from my culture. There are these quarter tones that you can use. The fact that Dorico can play these quarter tones. The magic for me is parts. I hate making parts, but Dorico is like, hey, I will do it for you. Usually, like 90% of the time, it's what you want. And then you just do a little bit modification and then that's it. And that saves a lot, a lot of time. Even the print, even like I showed one of my teachers a print and then he was like wow this is different i mean even the print looks different you know the fonts and and I, I, maybe the dpi or something i don't know but but it looks really good on paper as well for contemporary composers and people who want to do graphic notation dorico is now going into it it's, it's the beginning but even now it's really good yes i would definitely recommend dorico one of the main reasons and the first reason to get dorico is the price which is really good and also you get a lot of features, you get the, the sample library, you get the ease of making parts because it saves a huge amount of time. When you're composing or when you're working, you don't really have to think about finding things. If they're just there, you just have to have a general knowledge about the shortcuts and the whole tap system, and then uh, it will go great. The kind folks at Dorco have set up a special web page so you can go and download a free 30-day trial copy of Dorico. So go and do that. I have been using the program and I'm absolutely in love with it. Go to www.steinberg.net slash TPC. You know, something you just said about kind of keeping things separated. Like There are composers who write under pen names or don't want it known that they might do a commercial while they're doing art music or something. And I think those distinctions are falling away more and more. They are. You know, it's interesting to me because like I've been up for commercial jobs where, you know, everybody from Nico Mooley to Thomas Newman to Philip Glass, like they're all up for the same job, you know, mm -hmm. especially when you get to some of the tech brands, Apple and Google and Facebook and things like that. And there seems to be this, like, it's almost a double standard for composers. Oh, totally. Because, you know, Ridley Scott has no problem saying, hey, look at this Super Bowl commercial I directed. Isn't it great? And then at the same time, you've got, you know, directors in Hollywood that they don't want to know that their composers are working on commercials. They want to think they've got people that only make what they consider to be art. Yeah. Only film scores, and maybe an art installation or something like that. But it's a real double standard for sure. It totally is. I'm convinced that some of the greatest composers of the past would have absolutely written commercials. Mozart, for instance, he would have written anything for a buck. Oh my God. That guy would have, pardon my French, pooped out, you know, 50 <laughs> jingles a week, you know, like it would, would have been nothing for him. And he would have for the money. A hundred percent. You know, when I first started writing music for advertising, kind of when I started becoming a composer, like 10 years ago, that was what I used to equate it to. It was sort of like being a court composer you know, writing music for the king, you know, like, do I want to write music for this diapers commercial? No, I don't. That's not, that's not what I woke up today thinking I 
was my life goal of, of creating high art and why I went to Juilliard and all this. But if someone's called me and said, hey, I'm going to pay you, you know, 10 times what you're going to make for this film that's going to Sundance, <laughs> like, and it takes about, you know, half a day. Sure. That's a no brainer. <laughs> yeah. It's just common sense. So. Yep. Okay, you've alluded to it a few times here. Let's talk about your history. Sure. You went to Juilliard. You were a professional cellist. You've been principal cellist in major orchestras, including the Met Opera Orchestra, and you were in New Zealand. Tell me about that. You weren't composing when you first started your musician journey. You were strictly performing. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I was always noodling in my room as a kid, you know, so... Like I was plunking out tunes on the piano when I was two or three and wrote my first song, which included all of two notes um, that I would just play over and over and over again until I drove my parents mad <laughs> when I was like two. But um, but I was always noodling in the background, you know? So yeah, I started piano when I was five. I started cello when I was eight. You know, I played sports, was in musical theater, did all kinds of things. But cello, you know, kind of rose to the top and clearly became by the time I was 15 or 16 became pretty clear to me that that was what I was going to do. But I was always noodling. You know, I, I rebelled against my parents and moved down to the basement when I was 14. And I had some, you know, Casio keyboards and, you know, loop things. And I remember I recreated like, I, what was it? Um, every little thing she does is magic. <laughs> and I only had five loop banks and there was only like a certain amount of time I could, you know, play each part. And so I would sort of orchestrate it in my head and pull it out. And so, you know, it's kind of always writing a little bit, you know, in, in the shadows. And when my performance career became, you know, all encompassing, that was the thing. And so, you know, getting a job before I left university was incredible because all of a sudden I had, you know, a paycheck and I could take my friends out to dinner. And, you know, I was only 21 when I started. So the benefit to that was great. I don't have these struggling years where I'm trying to figure out what to do and where to live and how to make it. The downside was that it very quickly became Groundhog Day for me. Uh, you know, I, probably when I was 24, 25, I was like, after a couple of years in the Met, completely understanding how lucky I was to be there. I also realized that, you know, most of my colleagues were talking about, you know, repaving their driveway and, you know, their 401k and this and that. And I was just like, not interested. I was like, who wants to go to the bar? You know? <laughs> so I think when I was 25 or so, I started playing guitar and started a band and started playing gigs downtown and started playing on film scores. And if bands were coming to town and they needed a cellist for their appearance on Letterman or Saturday Night Live or something like that, I would go do that. And a lot of my classical colleagues were kind of I don't want to say they looked down on me, but they were like, oh, that Jeremy, he's always doing crazy stuff, you know? And I'm like, no, I'm actually, to your point, I'm actually like creating a diversified portfolio, you know? Right. Even as a cellist, I was doing lots of different things with the instrument. And then it reached a point where a good friend of mine that I met in a basketball game of all things had a studio downtown and we started hanging out and he helped me produce some songs that I was working on and wonderful guy. And he gave me a shot at writing music for a commercial. And lo and behold, the track I wrote, I was lucky enough to win. And that was kind of an eye opening experience for me in terms of, wow, you know, this didn't take nearly as much effort as, you know, playing a six hour long Wagner opera <laughs> and, you know, made me a nice chunk of change. And, and so that was kind of like the moment when I realized I was like, okay, maybe I should get back to what I wanted to do when I was two and three and start writing music. And there was a parallel path thing, you know, for a couple of years there. And it was exhausting and very taxing on me and my relationships in that I was a composer by day and a performer at night and a lot of espresso. <laughs> and, um, but even then, you mentioned this before our chat, you know, even calling yourself a composer feels a little bit weird. Like I remember when I first started writing, you know, from the world I was coming from, composers all had powdered wig and tights and, you know, it was a very serious thing. I, I didn't even feel right calling myself a composer. I just said, oh, yeah, I write some music on the side or whatever. But yeah, one thing led to another and, you know, a commercial leads to a short film and you do something for no money if it was you know, had some artistic value and was something you could be proud of and kind of, you know, you start to put things together and, and then it just rolls from there. 
And now that's a majority of your work. Yeah, it's all I do. The cello literally just, the only time I really take the cello out is to, uh, you know, either entertain my daughter or to play on my own stuff. I don't really, you know, take the stage anymore. Well, at least you know you have a cellist you can count on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I thought it's a quick call. <laughs> That's right. And you don't have to pay union scale. Yes, I'm very cheap. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do anything. <laughs> That's right. Well, one of the things that you recently worked on is this show for Disney Plus, because Disney owns Marvel, right. called right. Marvel 616. And I started watching the show, and the music was great because it was all over the place. I mean, how did that gig come about? So my friend Jason Sturman, who's the showrunner and the EP of Marvel 616, he and I worked together on 30 for 30 a couple of years back. I think that was the first time we met. And then we worked on an incredible series for Netflix called Five Came Back. And that was a pretty big gig. So I think he learned, as did I through that process, that I can pretty much do anything. And so he called me up and just said, hey, do you want to write the music for the main titles for this new Marvel show we're doing? And I thought about it for, you know, about a millisecond and said, yep. <laughs> and uh, so that was kind of where we started. And then... He asked me if I wanted to score one of the episodes as well. And I said, sure, because there's eight episodes and it's an anthology series. So, you know, each episode is kind of a standalone film. It has its own director, its own composer, the whole thing. And so I, I chose uh, one of the two episodes that had been shot at the time, which was a the comedy episode called Lost and Found. And it was directed by Paul Shear, And it's oh. absolutely hysterical. Yeah. What is that like? entering the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, it's huge and big budget and major composers. Yeah, it is. You know, I definitely had to take a look at, you know, what the fans were used to and what people were used to hearing. And certainly a lot of, you know, great music has been written for all those films and Alan Silvestri and Danny Elfman and Mark Mothersbaugh and, all, you know, all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. I really like the Guardians of the Galaxy scores as well, but I definitely knew where it was coming from. And it was a sound that's, you know, right in my wheelhouse. And yeah, as far as the main titles goes, it was actually really great because we had a conversation with the producers and the main title designer, Pat Clare, who's out of Sydney, Australia. He's done some Marvel opening titles. He's also done Westworld and True Detective. And he's just, he's brilliant. But he hadn't actually created anything yet. So he just called me and said, sort of walked me through what was in his mind and what he was thinking about doing. And then I just fortunately had the, the luxury of writing freely without picture. Really? Um, yeah, just with some rough timings. And I don't think this will probably ever happen again in my career, but I wrote one thing for it. I sent it to him. He said, thanks. And that was it. Wow. So that went all the way up the chain and everyone seemed to respond in a positive way. And, and that was it. So I did notice in the titles that there were hints of like, say the Avengers theme, like it's not there, but there's just like a little two note riff on the main motive or something. And it's like, okay, I get that. I can feel that I'm in the same universe. So congratulations on catching the vibe. Yeah. That, I mean, that was, that was definitely intentional. I mean, I, no. I obviously didn't want to use the theme or I wanted it to have its own voice, but it had to fit. It has to fit. But yeah, I mean, you could stick that I figure what the opening tiles is. It's like 30 or 40 seconds. It's pretty quick, but yeah, you could stick that in, you know, any Iron Man film or whatever, and it would fit right in there. So yeah. Yeah. And that must've been a lot of fun. It was, it was for me, those big action adventure, you know, scores are, they're really fun. It's me using everything that I know and everything that I come from. Like, I don't have to hire an orchestrator. I don't have to ask questions about, Hmm, I wonder what this will sound like. Like, I know I played in an orchestra for 14 years and you pull out as John Williams does, you pull out everything, you know, Stravinsky, Wagner, Strauss, all these, you know, incredible composers from the past. And those are the, that's kind of the sound in your head. And it's just a matter of, I don't want to say it's painting by numbers, but it's, it's pretty clear what, what the marching orders are for this kind of thing. Sure. So what's next? Next I'm working on a, I'm currently working on a Hulu film, which will come out in the new year. And a pretty interesting documentary about Google and search. 
So those are the two things on the horizon at the moment. And for one reason or another, I've been very fortunate to been you know really busy this year all during lockdown I was writing on chef's table and immigration nation and uh, a couple other projects so I haven't really had much time to catch my breath but I do have this you know laundry list of concert music that I'd like to get to if, if things slow down I think with the pandemic there's probably going to be another kind of hiccup where anybody that works in post production is going to have a little bit of a pause I imagine. So, yeah, that was my understanding too. And then I spoke to a friend who owns a big licensing company and TM. He's also a TV composer. Uh huh. And he says that projects are still happening. They're still work. It's just shifted. It looks different. Yeah. It's, I mean, anything that was already in production is trying to figure out how to pick back up. Yeah. And then anything that was about to go has been postponed. You know, so yeah, everything just, it's things are still happening, but yeah, it's just not happening in the same way that, that everyone's used to for sure. Yeah. Well, I want to end with one question in particular. Sure. And I'd like to ask you, what is one actionable piece of advice that for those listening to the podcast, what could they do today that will help move the needle on their business and move things forward? Ooh, that's a broad question. You know, I have so many composer friends the, you know, I think walking in the door, you have to have talent. That's just a given. So, but really, it's really only about 50% of what actually happens. The other 50% is everything that you're talking about. How do you deal with people? How do you gain the trust of a studio or a group of producers? And, you know, how do you make it known that you can deliver? So, like I said, there's a lot of talented people that are sitting around thinking, hey, I'm so talented. Why isn't anybody calling me? But you have to take action. You have to get out there. You have to hustle. So I'm not sure there's any one thing per se, but, and it's, again, it's harder during, during these times because you can't go to film festivals and you can't take people out to dinner and you can't, you know, go snoop around and see what's happening. It's all kind of digital at this point. So, I mean, good luck trying to, you know, schedule a Zoom call with mm -hmm. somebody you don't know very well. You know, there's not much incentive to do that. It just feels more awkward than it already does. So, but I think, you know, especially during this time, making sure that your, if it's a team or your infrastructure or whatever it is, is buttoned up and locked and ready to go so that when that opportunity does come, you can execute it and answer the call at a moment's notice. So I think... If this downtime during the pandemic, it's like making sure your catalog is up to date, uh, making sure that your team is ready to go. If it's a copyist or a music editor or uh, making sure your contact list is up to date. So if you're reaching out to people, you're not just sending out emails to people that are no longer there or their address has changed. Right? It's nitty gritty, boring stuff, but it's that other half of the business that has nothing to do with your talent as a composer and as a musician that you just need to make sure that's all ready to go because when that phone call rings for the big opportunity, you can't be scrambling trying to figure out what goes where. Like that already has to be well-oiled and ready to go. Yeah. So I know that's a pretty broad answer, but it's it's a pretty broad question too, I think. It's, there's it's not, super broad. Yeah. If there was like one thing, you know, everybody would just do this. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> But um, that's not what I was asking. It's not like there's a panacea or the one thing that we can do. It's just what's one action that people could take. Right. And you gave us a bunch. But what I really like is how you ended it. It's make sure that your whole machine, your business is well-oiled and working right. So when the opportunity comes, you're not scrambling. Yeah, you can't be, you know, especially if it's a film or a big project that's kind of all time consuming and is going to take up the next couple months or whatever. You can't be, oh, I meant to update these plugins or, oh, I meant to upgrade Pro Tools or, you know, I've been meaning to get a new computer. I guess now I really need it. You got to invest in your career and in, in your equipment and in your people and whatever it is at whatever level, you know, um, if you're fortunate enough to have a team or even if it's just working alone in your bedroom, like you got to make sure everything's ready and fired up and you can answer that call. Yeah. Jeremy, thank you so much for your time today. I've really enjoyed the conversation and you gave some <laughs> incredible insights and helpful tips on networking. And I love how you got to where you are. So thanks for telling your story. Of course. Thanks for having me on, Garrett. My pleasure. All right. 
This episode of the Portfolio Composer has been supported by Dorico, the music notation software from Steinberg. Whether you're a composer or arranger, a teacher or student, working in music engraving and publishing, or working in producing music for media such as film, TV, and games, Dorico is the tool for you. Dorico comes in two versions, Dorico Pro for professionals and Dorico Elements, providing the perfect introduction to the world of scoring. Whichever version you choose, you'll be using software packed full of smart features that produces beautiful results completely automatically, allowing you to get music on the stand more quickly than with any other software. You can bring music into Dorico from your existing software using Music XML or MIDI, and you can try Dorico out completely free of charge for 30 days by downloading a trial version from dorico.com slash TPC. Try it today. 